Artificial intelligence could be described as the inevitable next step in technology. Its ability to gather information, adapt, and learn could transform systems like education, finance, healthcare, and creative arts. That ability raises regulatory, legal, privacy, and ethical questions. The possibilities are endless and are both exciting and scary. So should we embrace or fear AI? Tonight's live broadcast and live stream of Kako, Hawaii's Town Hall, start now. Aloha and welcome to Kako, Hawaii's Town Hall, live from the Harry and Jeanette Weinberg Multimedia Studio. I'm Yanji Denise. Computers that can pass the bar exam, self-driving cars, voice assistants like Siri or Alexa that can answer a question faster than most of us can type it out. Artificial intelligence, or AI, is here, and most of us are using it in some form every day. It is hard to overstate just how ubiquitous these tools are, and many of us rely on them more and more. AI can process information faster than the human brain. That's led to wonderful innovations. In medicine, AI-powered diagnostic tools can be quicker and more accurate robotic surgeons more precise. In finance, algorithms can quickly spot and stop fraud. The list goes on. But there's also a dangerous downside. False information or so-called deep fakes can manipulate communities or sway voters. And autonomous weapon systems by design have no humanity. Kako means all of us, as in we are all in this together. And whether we like it or not, this technology is a part of our lives. We want to hear from you in our discussion. You can email or call in your questions. We're also streaming live at pbshawaii.org and on the PBS Hawaii Facebook and YouTube pages. In our town hall tonight, we have engineers, educators, students, cybersecurity experts, artists, writers, and an attorney. So let's begin. And before we get to our panel, we'll direct our first question tonight to ChatGPT. Now this is an open AI tool that is available on your phone designed to respond as a person. We have it right here. Let's activate and ask. What is a simple definition of artificial Could intelligence? Provide more context or clarify what you mean by activate and ask. Let's try again. What is a simple definition of artificial intelligence? Sure. Artificial intelligence, or AI, is when computers or machines can do tasks that typically require human intelligence, like learning, reasoning, problem solving, and understanding language. Let's take that and build off of it with our human intelligence here in the studio. I want to direct our first question tonight to Riley Higa, who is a senior machine learning engineer for Sumo Logic, an app security and monitoring company. If you could build on what ChatGPT just told us, what is artificial intelligence? Simple definition. Yeah, so there's kind of two types of AI um, that I think about. So there's kind of the science fiction um, version of AI, which is um, artificial general intelligence. Um, artificial general intelligence is basically an AI system that could do the tasks that a human can do. Um, it's, it does a lot of general tasks, so things like um, it has what, what I refer to as multimodality. So multimodality is it could work with images, videos, all kinds of uh, formats of data. Um, and then the other side of AI, which is kind of the tools we have now, is um, a more narrow version of AI that's dealing with AI that can do specific tasks like chat GPT or um, text to image um, generators like Dolly. Um, so those, that type of AI is more of a narrow focus um, in comparison to artificial general intelligence. It is so vast, and we're going to get into all of it tonight. Thank you. I want to go now to Ryan Ozawa, who is a journalist with a deep understanding of all things tech. You know, Ryan, a lot of us are interacting with AI on a daily basis and perhaps not even realizing it. I'm wondering if there's a unique way folks in Hawaii may be using these tools. Well, I think that um, when you look at the development of artificial intelligence and it's based on large language models, these are basically massive troves of language uh, scraped across the internet, entire library collections, and I think that when you ask about Hawaii, is Hawaii well represented in these data sets? Is Hawaiian culture well represented in these data sets? 
And I think that we're seeing a lot of really interesting things specifically because um, underrepresented cultures are underrepresented in these data sets. So there was recently a, a scandal where um, Google tried to introduce artificial diversity into its image generation, but because it wasn't based on anything that actually existed in its data set, it was doing things like making Chinese uh, people in Nazi uniforms. Like, it was absolutely faking the kind of DEI things that I believe we're all trying to accomplish. So I would uh, look at Kamuela in terms of what Native Hawaiians and what Hawaiian culture can do with AI to improve its representation. Yeah, and Kamuela, we know that that is some of the work that you are doing. Tell us about how you know we make sure that indigenous populations are represented in this work. We know that that is a lot of what your focus is on. Yeah, so I think one of the things I'm starting with is like, in the office I work with, um, this idea that if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And so much of AI as is understood can be extracted. I think the project we're a part of is a multinational conglomerate of indigenous people putting together a use case for AI. Not necessarily, not necessarily like vouching for it per se, but understanding it's ubiquitous. And I think one of the general premises is that when we make intelligence plural, intelligences, you understand that intelligence can't be a singular thing. There's different epistemologies and different worldviews, and that a lot of indigenous communities are used to being having our knowledge extracted. What type of space do we create to look at it? Because our ancestors as indigenous people had a process to vet new technologies, and quite opti often it was how does it optimize our ability to live in place, to be abundant, and to ensure that next generations can continue our practices. So I'm speaking in real general terms of a lot of complex work, but that's the general premise. Yeah. Um, I want to move now to Sean Watase, who's the founder of Block Studio 3, a company that helps to optimize workflow with artificial intelligence. Tell us about some of the clients that you work with, how they are utilizing this to make work easier for them. Yeah, so a lot of the businesses and everything that I work with, um, we don't really realize these day-to-day -day flows and tasks that we do are things that we can automate and simplify, uh, allowing us to get back time, allowing us to invest that time elsewhere where it matters. And a lot of what I do is really to sit down with these businesses, talk about, okay, what is it that you're doing in your daily operation, your daily work? And did you know that AI or that automation can actually do these things for you? So a lot of times, the amount of time that we save you know, clients and businesses, you know with time that they had to personally put in themselves to do things like accounting or generate content. Um, now they can focus that time elsewhere. And I think that's a big power of this technology is it can help and improve in areas. Uh, a lot of times we think AI could be this fancy uh, you know, technology stuff, but it can really help you in those really simple tasks. Um, it's just you know, sharing the knowledge, getting to know it, and how do we actually implement them into our, like, our businesses and day-to-day -day lives. Thank you. I, I want to move now to Leah Safina, who consults with some of the world's largest companies like Google and Alibaba in digital design and innovation. Leah, can you tell us what excites you about these tools, the practical applications of, of them? Sure. So when we look at practical application, I think it's helpful to divide our personal lives and our professional lives. And a lot of the conversation that's happening around AI is tied to the professional lives. Uh, should we fear for our jobs? How can we leverage AI to save more money? How can we automate different things? But on personal uh, side, I also am really excited about all the things that people were passionate about when they were kids or before they picked up their careers or fell into the careers that they're currently doing. And there's an opportunity to do something that you did not get a formal education on. People are passionate about interior design, fashion design. People want to do short movies or write a TV show. There's so many different areas, not necessarily only creative areas. And we can leverage AI as that supporting tool. You don't have to now have an education in fashion design to create a fashion collection. You only have your word, your sense of taste, your references, and your vision. And you can even use materials that are completely impossible to use in, in real life, like vapor or water, and create a fashion collection with that. So I would encourage everybody who's uh, watching this to also think about what are they passionate about, whether it's 
cooking or gardening or anything else and look into how AI tools can help them uh, really elevate their hobby. That sounds so exciting to be able to use this as a creative outlet. I love that idea. That's one of the positives. Um, another positive for some might be the, the use of this in education. I want to go to Clara Steele, who's a junior at Hilo High School. Clara, how are you and your classmates using this technology? Yeah, so I talk to a lot of my peers, a lot of my teachers um, about AI um, in preparation for this. And there's a lot of diverse opinions going on right now. You have some students who are adamantly quite upset about the use of AI. They say, I'm working so hard in this class. How is someone getting the same grade as me who is um, utilizing this um, artificial intelligence? You have other students who say, oh, it's great. It's helping me brainstorm. It's helping me create new ideas. It's helping me enhance my writing or my learning ability in ways that I wasn't able to before. And then you'll have the middle ground, which I think most students um, would fall into, saying that it's a great way to enhance your work um, if it is used correctly. Of course, you've probably heard a lot of students will do things like copy essays directly from um, outlets like ChatGPT, um, just taking the easy way out, you could say. So it is an incredible resource that can really change the way that we learn and educate, but um, the real question is how are we going to use it? Um, how are these students, are these students really going to do the right thing with this tool? Or are they going to cheat themselves out of education. That's so interesting, and I see the educator in our panel tonight nodding furiously <laughs> over here, so I want to get straight to her. Deborah Morita is a teacher at Hawaii Technology Academy, the state's largest statewide public charter school system with campuses across all four islands. Uh, Deborah, as an educator, what's your perspective on the fine line that Clara kind of uh, revealed for us tonight? Well, that is the fine line, so, um, and she's absolutely correct. Part of the problem when a new technology comes along um, for education is you're dealing with one of our most vulnerable populations. You're de dealing with our youth, our next generation. And this obviously is gonna be a part of their lives. And it's up to the educators to figure out how we're going to train and teach the students to use it and use it appropriately. And, um, and that is right now, the DOE does not have a policy in place for how to use it in the classroom and how to teach the students how to use it. And so right now it's up to every teacher. Personally, I don't use it in the classroom um, for assignments because I really believe that once you become an expert in something, that's fine. Like, you know, you said about hobbies, I love that. Um, but right now, this generation, we're trying to teach them to be critical thinkers, communicators, collaborators, to be creative. And their brains are still forming. You know, it's sort of like you have to train the bot in AI. Well, we need to train our students first to use their own intelligence so that they can get to that point. And then perhaps at another level would be the place for it. But right now it is definitely a hot topic in education and we're not, not everybody's on the same page yet. <laughs> yeah, and going back to that idea of training the bot and also what Kamuela Enos uh, laid out for us a moment ago, David Pickett is here. He's the Chief Technology of Officer for Purple Maya, whose mission is to empower the next generation of culturally grounded, community-serving technology makers. You know, building, David, on what Kamuela shared with us, uh, this technology reflects back what we put into it. So how do we make sure that what is being inputted, also what Ryan was telling us about, you know, these images that are obviously historically inaccurate and don't reflect the kind of images we necessarily want to see, uh, how do we make sure that the, that the voices are diverse and that they're being reflected back? Um, so I think there, it's a great question, uh, and I think it's great discussion in terms of community values and uh, the reflection of kind of this, this artificial intelligence or intelligences that are being created by us. Um, and I think, there's a, there, I think there are some good ideas out there on kind of how we can work towards better solutions. Um, so uh, Purple Maya recently had a, a machine learning hackathon, machine learning and AI hackathon. Um, one of the participants um, was a, a, a Meta employee, actually. Um, his idea was all around the alignment of LLMs. So the value system, the what's appropriate or not coming out of the chatbot, um, is, uh, it was, he used the terminology alignment, and he wanted to basically create a product where each community could create their own alignment training set that that community finds appropriate in terms of what images come out or what image or what uh, words come out, what's what's the right right or wrong. 
But the idea of this alignment platform is that it's voted on by humans. It's a training set for the AI, but each community gets their own alignment platform to say, well, we think this is okay and we think this is not okay. So I think, you know, to, to the point, right, we're not at AGI yet. We're not at a generally intelligent mm -hmm. um, AI. It, it still needs our instruction. It's like our kid almost, right, like you were saying. Um, and so it is up to communities of humans, humans, to train the AI on what's, what we think it should do or not. And it's probably up to different communities, right? Like, it, like you were saying earlier, how we use AI in Hawaii is probably different from how AI is used in other places. Um, but it's, it, that's not to say it's easy, right? I mean, I think to what you're saying, right, Ryan, like the, the large language models that we're relying on, Llama, you know, ChatGPT, um, all, all of those, um, scrape from the internet, but it's not necessarily equally represented or deeply represented. Um, sure. So you know, I, I think there's still a lot of work to be done, but I think there are good ideas out there. Um, it sounds like a very, very tough road <laughs> ahead. Um, you know, we talked about the, uh, we, we heard rather ChatGPT at the top of the program give an answer, but let's talk a little bit about AI generated visual content. We have heard about deep fa fakes, especially in the political realm. Take a look at some of these images of the two likely 2024 candidates for president interacting in a way they likely never will. What if we could make those <laughs> images move and talk? I went online and in less than five minutes, I made this video on a website called DID using a picture of myself from my cell phone. Aloha, it is great to be with all of you. I'm Yunji Denise. I'm a journalist at PBS Hawaii. Okay, so that video, not gonna fool anyone who knows me well, but someone with some more tech savvy could certainly make one that could. Let's turn now to Scott Robertson, who is the chair of the UH Information and Computer Sciences Department. Uh, Professor, what concerns you about deep fakes? About be deep fakes, well, what you just showed was a good example of how easy it is to make a deep fake. You said that you just did that in you know, a few minutes. And uh, we saw We've already seen a uh, deep fake of politicians uh, saying things that they wouldn't normally say, and these are being used in um, you know, anti-politician campaigns. So that is definitely something to be concerned about, and I assume that um, legislators are getting very interested in these kinds of issues. Um, but deep fakes are gonna be in all kinds of domains. So politics is one domain, another might be uh, dating, so there's no reason why there shouldn't be, there, that deep fakes wouldn't wind up on dating uh, websites. Um, it's winding up in uh, journalism, so uh, articles being written by AI that are not written by uh, real people or that are attributed to somebody who uh, didn't actually write it. So these are, and they're very difficult, and in fact, eventually they'll become impossible to uh, determine if it's a deep fake or not. So there's going to need to be some kind of a way of identifying deep fakes, some sort of uh, perhaps legislative, uh, you know, some sort of laws that, like we have with copyright laws, where we have to indicate, we have to credit something, or we have to indicate that it's satire or, or a deep fake. But if we can't trust our eyes, if you're saying there's no way for us to tell eventually, you know, how would we do that? Would there be some kind of a software that could actually tell us whether the video was authentic or not? So there is software right now that tries to um, identify um, computer AI generated images or text or other kinds of content. My feeling is that there will be a kind of a, a war where, you know, those those kinds of attempts to overcome faked material will just cause fake material to get better. And eventually, I do think it will be very difficult to determine what's fake and what's not. But we face that in real life anyway, right? I mean, there are people who don't tell the truth or uh, things like that. And so we have strategies as human beings for dealing with um, untruthful people or situations that are not exactly right. So we're going to have to uh, think about that in the world of AI as well. Let's move now to Al Ogata, who is CEO of Cybersecurity Hawaii. You know, Al, the professor just referenced dating scams. We could imagine financial scams. What are your concerns about the misuse of this technology? Well, well clearly, any technology can be used for good or bad. Um, and with AI, what we see is the potential to enhance scams that have been going on for a long time. 
uh, deep fakes are just one of them. But uh, impersonation really is the bottom line. Somebody is trying to impersonate somebody else uh, for either financial gain or, or love. And it's a funny thing to say from the cybersecurity standpoint, um, but when you look at the scams that go on, they're either done for money or they're done for love of something. Love of a cause, love of an ideology, love of um, um, uh, a religion. Um, and what it tells us is that we traditionally have thought about cybersecurity, information security as a technology issue. Uh, and what it's pointing out is that it's not technology alone that's going to help us here. It's really how people understand what's going on, how they establish trust. Um, and in some senses, I think we in Hawaii have a better chance than other places of coming up with defenses because we aren't only locked into technology. We aren't only, say, isolated from other people. Uh, we have conversations here, we have a diver diverse community, and by being able to talk to other people directly, um, you actually come up with that recommendation which typical security experts give you, which is to go out of band. So if you get an email, it's a phishing email, and it looks suspicious, you don't respond to the email. You go around it and try and find another method to confirm something. Um, if you get uh, a message on your phone, uh, and it appears to be from your daughter uh, saying she's been kidnapped, um, which is pretty distressing. It's, it's, it's a pretty hard thing to hear, but you understand that AI can do that because it can impersonate things. So what it says is in preparation for something like that, you want to have something you arranged with your actual daughter, like a secret word or something that's unique, that's not online, that you can use to say, is this really true or is this a scam that's being you know, fo foisted on me? So I think it points to the fact that um, we need to merge the human element into how we address these things. Um, software, for better or worse, or computer science, for better or worse, is different than any other science. It has no immutable laws. Physics or chemistry or biology, they all have immutable laws that we're trying to discover. Mm -hmm. But with computer science, it was created by man. It's ones and zeros. So if somebody can do a really good thing with it, someone can do a really bad thing with it. So we can't only rely on that to keep ourselves safe. That threat of humanity, I'm really hearing that throughout, that, that we really need to keep tapping into that. I want to go to Samantha Sneed, who is an attorney whose practice focuses on business, law, and technology. You know, Samantha, there are a myriad of legal questions that we could draw on for any of this, but when you look at AI, when you think about consumer privacy, copyright issues, disclosure on the part of the creators, what do you see as the biggest legal hurdle or, or legal thing to ta untangle when it comes to artificial intelligence? I think I'd actually like to echo Al, and the biggest tang entanglement or problem is not so much a technical one, it's not necessarily one in the law, it's one of people. And I think with artificial intelligence, it's really easy to lose sight of the fact that what has been created, what we're working on developing, is a tool made by people for people. And so it doesn't necessarily change the relationship between us, but I think what it does, because it, the tools are so powerful, they open up so much access to everyone, really. It accelerates the rate of our interactions, um, how we relate to one another, the context in which we can interact with one another. There's just so much more, and I don't think all of us are quite ready for that. And I think you, it's really reflective and you can see it when we watch our lawmakers and we watch our policymakers talk about this because it's easy to lose sight of that fact in talking about the nitty gritty of the different laws that are implicated because we are worried about these special interests. We wanna protect our consumers, our, our children, our business interests. Um, but really what we are talking about is how do we regulate ourselves? Yeah, and I, I feel like very, very not ready for any of this. That's why we're having this discussion tonight. Um, I want to bring in the viewers. You were already sending us your questions. Thank you so much. Keep participating online and on the phone. Um, this is a question from Chris Duque. Wondering if AI has been used to define God, who or what, she, it, 
is. If God is a person, thing, or concept, is God real? Does God exist? So before we send that question to the panel, we actually want to, again, employ another tool to kind of show folks who have not interacted with this technology how it can work in a very fast way. We have our producer, Jonathan Jenks, standing by at the computer. Uh, and he's uh, using ChatGPT, but on the computer instead of on a phone tonight. And he's asking ChatGPT, does God exist? And let's see what it says. So you can see the uh, the computer working in real time, and that was very, very fast. <laughs> I'm not going to read that whole uh, explanation, but you can see that it's uh, thought out, scraped the web, and figured out uh, what they would answer for whether God is real or not, or does God exist. Uh, and Jonathan, if you could ask ChatGPT to now turn this into a term paper on the same topic. <laughs> And this is really just to illustrate how quickly this technology works. So you see it lays out an introduction. It's then giving us bullet points uh, on, the, on the arguments for and against the existence of God. And then towards the end, it'll give us a summary. And we're not going to obviously go into this <laughs> full example. But this really, you know, you can see how fast this is working. This is working faster than I can even read it. Uh, and I want to go back to you, Deborah. When you see something like this and you think about a student perhaps tackling this, in a theology class, what goes through your mind? Um, well, again, I think that teaching students to do their research, teaching them to critically decipher the information, um, when they put it into chat GBT like this, and um, as our student panelist has said, um, there are students who will do that. They will, they will say that, it'll spit out a paper, and then they'll turn that in as their work. And um, it is getting harder and harder for teachers to determine um, whether it's their work or not. And I think that um, there is, you know, we've, we've talked about the humanity and the cautions, and there is a place for AI, obviously it's here. But, um, but this is just one example of how when something isn't trained, when something isn't disciplined, I was thinking about the panelists earlier who said like a child. You know, with children we, we put rules in place. We put a structure in place. We, we train the children to do things in a certain way. And without those rules and regulations guarding this, that's when you're going to have chaos. You know, without structure, without rules, without regulations, um, without these parameters put in place, chaos is going to happen. And you're going to have students who are turning in work like this that, that they really can't answer on their own if they're in a conversation with you and I. If I ask that student, hey, that was a really great paper. You know your um, arguments. Can you go over those with me? You know, that's probably my best way of finding out if they wrote the paper or not. And so I think that um, the first step is to, to find out when, where, and how we're going to use this, and then put those, those rules in place so that we don't have you know, the chaos. Yeah, Clara, I want to ask you about that. You know, I, I can see how easy it would be or how seductive it would be to then just type in uh, whatever the paper is and maybe um, use that as like the, the core of the work and edit it and then mm -hmm. try to make it your own. What, what are your thoughts on how this can be used in an appropriate way? Yeah, so um, obviously AI is something that's here to stay. There's nothing we can do to get rid of it. Or you can minimize the use in the classroom, but students are still going to find their way around it. So we have to work around it. We have to find ways where it can be used. Um, in this case, I would say um, the most beneficial way that I find, and also my fellow classmates um, from talking to them, would be through um, brainstorming, especially brainstorming different perspectives with ChatGPT. Um, although, of course, it is not as inclusive as it could be, it can provide a lot of perspectives that you, as one person, might not think of. So it is a great way to enhance your thought process um, and then make that your own, make that your own piece of writing. Um, so in this case, you know, do you believe in God? Um, ask ChatGPT about different religions around the world. It's a great way to concise all that our information into just one short, um, like, tab. So it's a great way for uh, you to kind of enhance your knowledge. Um, of course, if you're using it, um, then to, of course, enhance your own writing. 
I want to um, go to more uh, questions from the audience. Mike in Hilo says, uh, can AI create its own news anchor and have that anchor? Well, we saw that. <laughs> <laughs> have that anchor report as long as the station wanted it to. In other words, replace the human anchor. And Teresa from Mountain View says, because AI is so vast, will it eventually replace people in certain jobs in the future? And Sean, I wonder if you could take this on because I did yeah. explore your website and I saw that you know some of that creative content. Uh, one of the big ads on your on your website was you, but not you, yes. advertising your product. So you're already sort of doing this with yourself. Yeah, um, and to the, like the news anchor um, idea. There's actually, um, I forget which country it is, but they actually started a whole news channel based around AI where it runs 24-7. Uh, they are just feeding it constant articles or news events and things like that. And this AI will then digest that, create a video, and yeah, it runs you know 24-7 on whatever information that news station is feeding that AI. But I think along that lines, there are a lot of areas and areas that I help many businesses accomplish these types of things. That video on my website, for example, um, is using a, an AI tool that I basically just recorded a two minute video of myself and I you know, set up the nice camera, I got some nice lighting. You know. Normally that would take me 15, 20 minutes to do and if I needed to do it repetitively every single day I need to record something, it's time consuming. Uh, so with this AI, I record it once, and now I can just go on this tool, give it my script, and it will generate that AI video for me, and I can use this. And again, it's the way I look at AI and how I explain it to many people that I help is it's efficiency. It's can I chip away at some time that you would normally spend doing something, and now can you invest that time elsewhere where you want to invest it? Um, so yeah, there are many tools out there and they're very interesting to play with. It's again, there's the good and the bad and how you can implement it. Um, I like to focus on the good, of course, on how I can help businesses. Uh, but yes, yeah, there's many tools out there. Yeah, but Ryan, weigh in on this for a second. You know, do you think that you know the, the viewers are concerned that this can replace human beings in the workplace? What do you see as the capacity for that? It depends on the work. Yeah. I think that what I've been thinking about lately, especially as a writer, and we're high on the list of c careers that might disappear with uh, artificial intelligence, is we've made this big transition from the industrial age, manufacturing, to the information age, but now we're creating a tool that makes information a free-flowing commodity, right? The value is still there, and I think, you know, as Al said, focusing on the human will always be, I think, important. But now knowledge-based jobs, programming, writing, um, can and will soon be disrupted by these technologies. So it is terrifying. Um, I've you know worked with organizations that did lay off writers because they were like, oh, an AI can do this. But the funny thing is these tools have been doing this, whether it's the autocomplete on your email or AI has been writing sports articles for years because it can take a box score from a baseball game and write a story as if it had been watched. Um, what, I've, what I've been thinking for my own kids, for example, is that we might go back to valuing the things that only humans can do in 3D space until robots come along. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm like, I should have been a plumber maybe. Like that's probably where the value is going to be in five years, maybe not so much in writing. I think that raises an important distinction though, right? Because I think what artificial intelligence is particularly good at doing is replacing certain functions, certain tasks it's good at doing. It doesn't necessarily replace the people doing those tasks. And so people who have those skill sets, that foundational knowledge, can repurpose it in other ways. And I will say, having reviewed work that it, are legal documents um, <laughs> that have definitely been generated by artificial intelligence, you can tell. So it does take some level of expertise that a human already has to produce a usable work that is useful to humans. Leah, I want to bring you back in um, because you had these great examples of perhaps fashion or art that could, we could generate with AI and kind of put in our own um, prompts and then create something from that. But there is this question of ownership, right? And, and who actually generated the work. If I say create a fashion line in the style of Chanel, but you know, add in colors, these colors or what have you, who actually owns that work? I mean, who actually generated that idea? Yeah, so the legal sphere of AI is extremely unclear right now. There are so many conversations happening in the US, in Europe, in, in Asia, around what type of laws should we put in place. Um, and 
as far as each individual tool, uh, they're really tackling it in their own way. There are certain tools that you pay for that have databases that were officially cleared for commercial use. So you know that whatever you will generate with that, such as um, Adobe Photoshop has a Firefly extension, mm -hmm. and they only train their model on uh, photography that was cleared for commercial use. Other tools have not yet um, agreed to that, or it's really case by case. But another thing that I think we did not mention today yet is that um, AI, as it is right now, is truly a mirror um, that's being held up to us. It doesn't produce anything new. It only synthesizes uh, synthesizes information based on the databases that it was trained on, right? So you cannot really expect a new Einstein, but what you can expect is an original way to uh, merge things together. Um, there are a lot of experimentations happening in creative arts fields. There's an AI, uh, and I actually participated in two of them. Uh, I always wanted to make a TV show, and I've uh, participated in an AI short movie festival where I used a tool called Runway to generate a two-minute short movie. Uh, I wrote the script, but every single shot was prompted by words. And there are even new professions that are called people who are specifically uh, have expertise in writing really elaborate prompts, right, to really get precise on what you get out of it. But so a lot of experimentation right now, no, no clear outcome yet in terms of uh, legal aspects uh, apart from very specific tools. But I would encourage everybody to experiment. And uh, to your point, it's not AI that's going to replace humans. At the moment, it's humans who know how to use AI that will replace humans who don't know how to use AI. That's so interesting. And Scott, can you build on that? You know, yeah, are we all are we all destined essentially <laughs> to become computer programmers of one kind or another? So AI is going to change a lot of uh, jobs, but not necessarily replace the people that are doing them. But the people that were doing them are going to need to uh, learn to interact with AI, which will assist them in those jobs. Are we all going to become computer scientists is a really interesting question. Mm -hmm. um, the, and I think the answer is definitely no. <laughs> but we are going to become, uh, we are going to need to become capable of interacting with AI systems uh, to help them help us. So the CEO of NVIDIA, I think it was, just recently said, um, Nobody should study computer science anymore, which is very frightening <laughs> to uh, all those of us in computer science, science yeah. university. <laughs> but uh, what he said was they should study uh, some other content area like biology or chemistry or history or uh, you know fashion design or filmmaking or something like that, and then use AI, learn <coughs> how to use AI systems to help them plan at a high level uh, what they want to do. I want to bring in Zanita from YPO and Riley, if you would take this one. You know, we set out the premise of this program as embrace it or fear it. Uh, but this viewer says the thing is to try to understand it, learn as much as possible about it first before re reacting to it emotionally. Do you think that premise is, is false? Embrace it or fear it? Do you think understanding it perhaps is the better take? Yeah, definitely. Like um, when I like try to speak or talk about AI, um, I want people to be cautiously optimistic about AI. So I, I, I don't necessarily want people to either embrace it wholly or fear it wholly. I want people to kind of have a balance of opinions. Um, so I do um, educational events around um, Honolulu, um, mostly regarding understanding AI. So understanding the ethics of AI, understanding what are the safety concerns, the security concerns with AI, and so I definitely agree that um, building understanding of AI is, um, is important yeah. to make that decision. Kamwala, tell us about the work that you're doing in this regard, incorporating indigenous knowledge in these systems and why that's so important. Yeah, I think you know, it's part of a practice of like, not acting like everything is a homogenous whole. Like There are many different perspectives. So I think one of the things early on that as a thought exercise that we put into a proposal is like, what if a community organization owns the AI? And their community organization is in charge of perpetuating a practice and a community and growing food. And they train the AI on like, the partnership with partners at the university who are doing research on soil and some of this high-end soil analysis to have AI train the organization to better understand soil health over a climate change regime. 
and if they trained AI on some of the data they're getting from the spectral analysis and Hawaiian language newspapers, but the community owned the whole process. And that's when we learned this idea of there's a corpus, there's an algorithm, and there's a use case. And that to me is so important, right? I think that we come from ancestors that use printing presses and watch their culture change from oral to written. And that was so disruptive, right? But the, I think when communities have a practice, AI can never replace a tarot farmer. It can never replace a fisher person, right? So when they design AI, like our indigeneity is important because we come from a different worldview. If we have a capitalist one, we're going to look how to make a dollar out of it and how to optimize for your product productivity tied to revenue. Indigenous AI, if you were to do it and it was a curiosity, like well, how does it optimize for abundance? How are you using these tools to help us take in data and critically analyze it to give us the best case scenario, which is in alignment how our ancestors used to use their technologies? I think the last thing is to reclaim the word technology, not as new. There's ancestral technologies, fish ponds are technologies, local AI tech, our technologies. Um, technologies does not necessarily require electricity. It actually comes from the most primal technology as a community. So I think when we're holding curiosity and holding fear, but also holding wonder in the same space is some of the spaces we're trying to hold and figure it out. I'll let you know how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, David, I want to go to you to build on that. Uh, what's interesting, what you had, uh, when I had asked you a question earlier, that you said that there, there's a, P perhaps a push to have communities reflected in the AI, and that's really what Kamala is also talking about. Um, but how do we make sure, because this is happening, you know, I can think of it in media, that we're all in our silos and we're watching, we're in our echo chambers. How do we prevent that from happening with this technology as well, so that the AI system that we use here in Hawaii just reflects our values, but that, you know, in another community, we could be missing out on great knowledge, and, and they could too. Yeah, you know, I, I think, like you're saying, you can kind of have that risk. We, we always have that risk, I guess, with technologies and the, the, the silos that develop. Um, but I think to, to com I think to kind of follow up with, on what Kamu's saying, right, the, it's, it's community leadership, right, that, that helps us navigate through that. Um, you know, I, being at Purple Maya, you know, knowing Kamu and folks at UH, I, I think one of the greatest strengths of those organizations is the networking with the people and the other organizations. Um, and I think, you know, to what a lot of the panelists have been saying, right, it's like it, the people are at the heart of our decisions, right? The people are at the heart of our problems, but also our, our decisions, right? So the communities of people, we, that's how we, that's just something we have to keep in mind to navigate, right? It's like, I, I think in, to, to talk about maybe also specific AI technologies in relation to this, um, I think there's there's a bit of a um, sort of a competition going on uh, in the world between sort of what what people consider like closed AI models and like open source AI models, um, and it's an ongoing conversation, right? Um, but I think community groups and ownership and like community ownership of models, yep. at least in my perspective, the way I believe, leans towards the open source AI models because you can see how it's built. You can see who owns which components. You can have this discussion of, well, we built ours this way, and you guys built yours this way, and we can compare, and we can share notes. Um, and who decides? Who gets to decide whether uh, you know it's open or closed? And, and for those folks at home who might not be familiar with that kind of terminology, we're dealing with a wide range of knowledge base. I know everyone in here is super tech savvy. But um, for those who aren't, Explain briefly the difference between an open system and a closed system, and who gets to choose which one dominates. Sure. Um, well, so like a closed system is like um, you know under control of a company, whether that's OpenAI or you know Facebook and Meta or Google. Um, but the open source model, and actually I shouldn't have said Facebook because they're one of the big proponents of open source models. Uh, the idea is that the the weights are released to the community, the research papers are released to the community. People can generate their own. Now, it happens to be that like Facebook or Meta put in a ton of dollars to train theirs, but then they make it available for everyone to use. So in my mind, that's how I see the difference between a, a closed model and an open model is whether the building blocks have been given to the community, to the world, to then tinker with and improve or, or, or change. Um, and to the question of who decides, I mean, it's, it's kind of this difficult capitalist kind of situation, right, of in AI and in a lot of technology, sometimes it's winner take all. So like, uh, at least the way I, I see situations like that with ChatGPT where 
everybody thinks of ChatGPT4 as the smartest. So if you need something complex, you need some reasoning, you basically go to the smartest, and that means you have to pay them, whether it's the $20 a month for their web service or per their API calls. Um, but all the open source folks are trying to catch up, right? Their open source models are as good as 3.5 now, as long as you have the hardware to run it. Um, but it's the market forces that decide, right? It's who has the top scientists, who has the top dollars to spend on it, but then also what, as consumers, do we want to use? What do we want to support? What do we talk about? What do we share? And I think that raises other really critical questions that we as a community need, need to have discussions around is that, again, the who decides and how do we decide? Do we want to be able to preserve access to this technology in a way that our community groups, our individuals are able to determine by learning how to use it? Or is that decision making something we're okay with leaving to other groups who might not share the entire body of their knowledge with us? And I think one of the, the, the challenges is even companies that start out with the greatest intentions mm. are motivated by market forces. Google used to say, don't be evil is our motto. That hasn't been true for a long time. <laughs> OpenAI, the biggest company we're talking about that dominates the space, is started as a nonprofit with the goal of making humanity better. But as we saw with the turnover and the attempted coup with the CEO, the commercial viability of OpenAI is way too powerful for them to just give it all away. But the importance about the open source models that I think we're talking about is if those remain available, even if OpenAI goes down, if Amazon quits, if Google gives up, if you have computing power, whether it's your phone or your computer at home and you have access to these models, you can still use these technologies, tweak mm -hmm. these technologies, build them the way you want to, to do them. It removes the controls that these companies put in place for good and for bad, but I think that freedom is why we're probably advocating for the open source model. And really quickly, I just want to, I was remiss to um, not share this earlier. If there's a good resource to look at, how I got involved in this, there's an um, indigenous scholar named Jason Lewis who's working out of Canada. He convened the indigenous AI working group. So he got indigenous people from across the world to come to Hawaii and create an ethic and a basic, you can download it, indigenous-ai.net that has voices of practitioners from around the world who intersect indigenous practice and computational sciences, giving their perspectives that is kind of grounding our approach. So I didn't, I meant to Not acknowledge how I got <laughs> pulled in. So I think another viewpoint on open sourcing in terms of AI is who gets to train these systems? Yeah. Not just whether you can see inside them, but do you actually have uh, the power to uh, give them feedback uh, and train them on what you think, the way they should think? Yeah. So I'm, you know, the indigenous AI aspect that, you know, if you have that kind of knowledge that, and you can um, tell an AI system that that kind of knowledge is important, uh, then you can influence to some extent it, the way it um, thinks. And one last sentence I just forgot to mention too. Part of why we did that thought exercise was because we're looking at locating this process out in Waianae and we recognized we did this study on the bipartisan commission on automa mechanization. And so the communities that are most likely to be impacted yeah. are blue collar communities. Mm -hmm. And therefore we saw if we house this in an indigenous organization, a rural community, around how do they use it to grow food and have it, they own the IP and everything. You could teach Python at your high schools to get your students to learn about this and have it be something that they're not alienated from. At the very least, they're inoculated to, and they can make choice and control, like have choice and control in what they want to do with that technology in the future. Thank you. I want to bring in this comment from Chris, uh, and I would love it if Al would take this. Uh, when you write a paper, you cite the sources of your references. AI needs to divulge the same. That will help the viewers see behind the curtain. How do you advise folks to try to see behind the curtain? I, 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 whether you're talking about AI or things that are generated by a human, um, I think it's the same question. You know, how do you know what they're telling you is true? How do you know what they're quoting as a source is correct? Um, and, and it goes to, I guess, our ability to trust what someone's saying, but then verify basically that it's true. And whether someone uses AI to generate it, or they simply just write it themselves and, and make it up, um, there needs to be that validation. And I think in all the topics we're talking about, whether it's whatever job you're doing or um, a new service that comes up, um, you just have to remember that 
AI makes mistakes. It's not, it's not omnipotent where it can do everything and humans are going to be obsolete. It, it's the kind of thing that's change oriented. It is going to change things, but you still have to be able to validate that everything it's saying is true. And it's not going to be all true, just like people make mistakes. So. Well, on so that topic a, of being omnipotent, I want to bring in this, these two questions. And actually, uh, Scott, you're just the right person to take this, <laughs> which is, um, Kenson says, what can be done to prevent AI from reaching the ASI or transcend transcendental stages, or is that beyond prevention now? Uh, and another person on YouTube saying, does AI, the threat of AI becoming self-aware merit concern? We have these you know, fears about the Terminator coming to get us. Uh, is, there, is there any basis to that? OK, let's see. I'm, not, I'm the person to answer that. <laughs> I mean, one thing that's a very strange, it's related to what you just said. Um, we can't see inside of AI systems. They're not inspectable. We talk about inspectable AI. You, you can't tell where things come from. They, uh, AI systems, you know, pull information from all over the internet and other sources. And then when it comes out, you can't really say where it came from. I mean, it, yes, it looks like something that somebody did, or maybe you say do it in the style of someone, and it comes out in that style. But you still don't really, you can't source where it came from. The bigger question about you know transcendence, I, I don't know, <laughs> but um, it's going to become uh, like it, it's going to become something that's difficult to uh, understand what what it's doing and why it's doing it. So I think you know maybe that's an issue of what are its motivations. Uh, right now, I'm not sure it has any motivations, but at some point, when AI starts to be part of the community and so on, uh, researchers are going to start to think about. What are its goals? Well, it does have some motivations. In finance, it has motivations like make more money for whoever's using it, or in art, make something more beautiful. You know, at some, some point, those kinds of goals are going to be important to AI systems. And I don't know if those goals will ever be transcendent goals. <laughs> Leah, what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> well, uh, I know that several companies are now working on getting to that goal. And the first time the Ryan, Ryan was just referencing the coup that happened at OpenAI, I didn't sleep that whole night. I was reading up on what's happening and how close are they. And I know that um, OpenAI's founder er, mentioned that within the last four months, he has witnessed, witnessed several times things that transcended what he expected. That left him speechless. He didn't specify what he saw, but that reaction from the CEO of the company says a lot, right? I think what we can do um, as society, as a community, I don't think anybody here has an answer, you know, what to expect and what should we do in that case. But I think we should be really aware uh, of being manipulated. I think that's one of the skills, number one skill probably, that we need to teach our children and that we need to learn ourselves is hyper-awareness of the motivations and ability to manipulate anything from voice to imagery to information. And OpenAI, it's, it's very new technology. It's been around for a couple of years. It lies very confidently. It makes mistakes very confidently. And we as humans are emotional, and we tend to trust the confidence. So we need to enter the era of critical thinking mm -hmm. um, as a society, as a community, yeah. and teach those skills and emphasize it in schools and at workplaces. Yep. Yeah, Clara, I want you to take that on. And, th and there's a sort of dovetailing right on that. Krista says, people relying on it to the point where they forget what common sense and critical thinking are, which yeah. has already been happening. Uh, that's her main concern about AI. You know, given that, the, that there is no sort of DOE policy mm -hmm. here in Hawaii on how to approach this technology and what to do with it, do you feel like you're getting given the tools on how to approach this as a student. I mean, we know that you know you're, we invited you here because you're a smart thinking individual, but uh, do you feel like you're actually given any instruction on how to interact with this technology? That's a really great question, and I think that even goes beyond the scope of AI. I feel like my generation is becoming increasingly um, you know, lower attention spans. We have this um, constant like stream of information coming at us, and I feel like that along with this um, rise of artificial intelligence, not to say that we're getting dumber by any means, but certainly I feel like our critical thinking skills have kind of, in a way, not necessarily that they've gotten worse, but we've just not been as used to using them as much as maybe we've had to in the past. So I really don't think that, at least in the educational system, we've been given the tools 
to use these um, resources safely because it might seem great to you know write your term paper um, using AI and then you can have a great night's sleep that night um, but in actuality you're hurting yourself and I don't think that we're um, really equipping our students with the tools that we need in order to use these properly because they can be great resources but I think that my generation has a lot of um, hills to climb in the terms of um, rapid increases in technology like we've never seen before. So it's definitely going to be a really big battle, and I don't know how we're going to do that. <laughs> Deborah, I, I would love for you to, to take that on. I mean, you said earlier that critical thinking is the, you know, it's the core of what every teacher, you know, tries right. to impart on their students. Should there be some kind of a policy or some kind of class, if you will? You know, I, I, I'm old enough that I took typing, right? <laughs> but should we be teaching students how to engage with this technology? Yeah. And just for reference, um, I think my students always find it hilarious that when I began teaching, we didn't have computers. <laughs> and the internet did not exist, nor did we have cell phones. Um, so it's been a huge increase in technology, and now I'm at a technology school. So, you know, I hear what you're saying. And so I will say that while I say I don't use it in my classroom, I don't use it for classroom assignments. But I have been training my students to use AI. I know I held that back a little bit, but um, as a digital media, creative media teacher, and talking about the arts that we've been talking about, um, I still want the creativity, I still want the critical thinking skills. So I'm training them in, in the very fundamentals, the basics, um, for, you said, for scripting. Um, so they're taking interviews. And then there is an AI system they can put these these audio clips or these video clips into, and it'll produce the script for them, and it'll tell them everything that was said, the timestamps for it, and that goes to efficiency. Instead of my students spending hours trying to transcribe these on their own, there's an AI system that'll do it for them quickly, but then it's up to them to read through it, to use an old-fashioned highlighter what was the most important sound bite from that interview and where am I going to put that in my video and to still go out using the equipment the technology and filming things um, and putting it together so we are trying to begin training our students and and also the fact that we don't have policies in place right now makes it each teacher's responsibility, each individual teacher's. And there are some teachers who, who totally disagree with me and think it's completely fine to have students using it to write their scripts and to um, take a paper, use that as the fundamental, kind of, you know, put their own voice to it and hand it in. Um, I'm not there yet um, because of the whole critical thinking and their mind still developing. But I do see the efficiency. I do see the benefit in some of these programs. And we do need to start somewhere. And that's where I think we start with these um, students and this generation is introducing them to specific um, programs and platforms that are out there and specifically what to use it for to help with efficiency but not to cut into the critical thinking and collaborative part of it. So I, I did you use chat. <laughs> I, 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 I know we have a lot of thoughts and that's great. That we love that. Right, Riley, go ahead. Um, oh, so I can answer kind of this issue with misinformation and blind trust, what mm -hmm. we're trying to do from an engineering and research perspective. So there's a lot of uh, research and engineering going on with making, trying to make these models interpretable. So making sure that if it gives an answer, can it reason about how it got to that answer. Um, right now, like most systems are not very interpretable. Okay. Um, the second thing is having AI communicate uncertainty. So that's been a research topic. Um, mm. You mentioned like AI can be very confident in certain answers. And in some cases we don't want, we want the AI to communicate in situations in which it's, in which it's uncertain. So for example, like if you have a self-driving vehicle and it off-roads, um, you want it to be able to say, okay, I haven't seen this situation before, so 
the driver needs to take over rather than confidently <laughs> navigating. <laughs> Continuing on, that's a great, that's a great example. Um, and I, I, this next question, I would love it uh, if Sean would take it and then Leah, if you would also expand on this. Robert from New Uanu says, if the purpose of art is human to human expression, why would I want to read a book or watch a movie created by AI? And in the same way, I know that you do a lot of content generation. Why yeah. would I want to watch content created by AI? Yeah, um, uh, I'll answer this kind of answering and piggybacking off the last one. Um, of AI, it's kind of a mindset shift that I think a lot of people need to make when utilizing it. Um, I think a lot of people look at AI of, it's a tool that gets me from zero to 100. Whereas AI kind of works in the middle. It'll get you, maybe you have to do zero to 10. 10 to 80 is taken care of with AI by making things more efficient, by maybe uh, using its tools to generate something, and then you put that last 10 to 20% of a personal touch on top things. Uh, the way I explain AI is like, if everyone started using AI, everything would look the same. And I work with a lot of businesses and marketing and advertising, and the idea behind marketing and advertising is to make your stuff stick out. And a lot of times it's being able to add that personal touch, that little bit of something else to the art or the video that you generated that showcases your personality, that showcases your personal touch to it. And I think in that middle part, that's where you can utilize AI. That's where you can generate things quickly. You can have a conversation. Um, I think that's another point too. Uh, a lot of people use ChatGPT. They ask it a question trying to get a defined answer back. Uh, ChatGPT is like a text thread. Uh, you can have a conversation with it. And that's where you get, I think, a beneficial of being able to have critical thinking uh, in terms of using ChatGPT is if you have a conversation with ChatGPT like it's another person, I do that. Uh, I work remote, so I'm by myself a lot of times. <laughs> I just need someone to bounce ideas off of. Like if I had someone next to me and I was, you know, you just grab your coworker and you're like, hey, did you know this? Or like, what if I did this? And sometimes that person doesn't even need to respond, but it gets that train of thought mm -hmm. going. Or, or um, like a tutor. I mean, yeah, I like a tutor. That's what I was wondering. <laughs> you guys think about like in the classroom as a tutor. But. Yeah, it's um, just different ways you can use it, I think. Um, and that, again, it's just a shift in how we think about it, I think. Um, and then the beginning and end, you know, you can just add your own little personal touches, that little extra to give it a little bit more. Leo, I, you said that you wrote, you know, you put a two minute television show together. <laughs> why, to answer Robert from New Uanu, why would I want to watch that show created by AI? Uh, I wouldn't want to watch a show created by AI alone. Uh, that's definitely my stance here. But there's all, the point of art is to connect and to communicate a human emotion and experience and to bring us closer and to live through something maybe we personally haven't lived through but we can relate to it, right? So I think it is a tool. There's always, there always has to be a human behind that art. Um, I, would, I would also suggest that there's always an easier way to understand new technology when we look back, um, backwards in time. Um, it's kind of like asking why would I trust a mathematician that used a calculator? right before right before it was introduced uh, we are now in times imagine before search was introduced and we're all scared like oh does is google going to kill uh, libraries why would we all use search or before mobile phones were introduced right oh we're all going to walk around with these boxes in our pockets it seems really scary but now we are all using them as a tool to help us create art write books do everything right so i think the, one of the reasons why i'm personally very excited about it as a tool is that it evens out the playing field a little bit. If any one of you wanted to create a movie right now that would be, say, put on Netflix, you would need to move to Hollywood, uh, create connections with anybody who would even to pitch to people, right? To get people in the room with influence to then get you producers, get you budgets, attach actors to all of that, then film it, that spends so much money and so much betting on it being successful. When you have an AI tool, you can just take your idea and really quickly prototype it. It might not be perfect, but at least your idea is now not just a thought in your head, it's something tangible yeah. that you can show to people and have them instantly connect to it. So I think it's really evening out the playing field a little bit and allowing people from underprivileged communities to enter into some of the areas that we are reserved only for people with connections, money, location, et cetera. I mean, I love your enthusiasm. David, I wonder, <laughs> do you share it? Do you see it in that same way? Uh, I think I do. <laughs> I mean, I think I'm, I'm pretty optimistic. So, you know, I, I, we were having the discussion about, like, you know, uh, are AIs going to replace humans? I mean, I, and I'm firmly on the side of, like, AI will augment humans, or at least in the short term. I think to the question of transcendence, I think it, that's maybe a little bit too far out <laughs> to know. 
Uh, but in the short term before that, I, I think we'll, it'll be a lot of humans being augmented by AI. Um, and I think that's great for a lot of the reasons that we've been talking about. Um, as I was mentioning earlier, right, like I think in, for me personally, and I'm really curious what you guys think in the classroom, but I think tutor, like AI as a tutor is really <coughs> useful to me like personally in my job if I have to learn something. I can just sit there and for like hours ask ChatGPT questions and then go search and ask questions and ask more questions and explain this to me. Because um, you can also say to it things like, you know, pretend I'm a five-year-old. Explain it to me like I'm a five-year-old, and it'll, it'll write, it'll write it to that that level, right? Or, oh, I have a background in such and such math. You don't have to explain that. Okay, yeah, I'll take that into account. And, it'll, and it's like the most patient tutor ever. Um, <laughs> so I think this idea of like augmenting people, augmenting decisions with AI tools, I, th I think will make the world a better place. Now, I mean, as as we talk about it, right, like. There are risks, um, you know. People want to scam people. We talked about scams. Scams will get easier in the same way that regular jobs will get easier. Um, but the more people, I think, and I think we've talked about this too, the more people that get exposed to what is possible with AI, both in terms of you using it yourself and the outputs, I think the better, because um, people will hopefully get fooled less easily will have more create, uh, critical thinking if they realize what's what's possible. Um, but I, I think that's the ideal goal, right? That like we use computers and tools to make ourselves better and more fulfilled. And I think to Kamu's point that we generate abundance for our communities. Yeah, and so Samantha, I wonder if you could build on that as well, because uh, what he's talking about is a system where people are trustworthy and good. And but I do all think <laughs> I also think we need some guardrails with this technology, right? Um, and so Melvin from El Eva Beach says, I think we should both embrace and fear AI, and lawmakers should do something to control it. Uh, is that possible? Is legislation keeping up? <laughs> control is a control is a hard word, and so. <laughs> Again, I think it's really critical for everybody to remember that AI is a tool oh. by humans for humans. And right now we're at the stage where the technology is accessible, it is learnable by everyone. <coughs> but if we see the ground of, or if we leave the thinking of how to develop particular AI tools to others, if we don't engage in that, yep. we're letting others decide how we should be yep. utilizing a very powerful, powerful technology. And so if we're looking at controls, I think when we talk about what kind of controls we want to put in the law, what the law's function is, is basically a set of rules, just like programming, that humans agree on. This is the relationship that we are going to have with one another in our community. And so if this technology is in our community, we need to decide, all right, what are the ground rules with interacting with each other through it? Um, how that looks in every community I think is gonna be different. And you're already seeing um, very vastly different approaches all over the world as to what people think AI, it, what the appropriate use of AI is and shouldn't be. And so right now the US is kind of cautiously saying, well, everybody should get involved and we'll see. Um, internationally, other governments are taking really, really different approaches. Hmm. Al, I see you nodding over there. What are your thoughts? <clears throat> Are lawmakers keeping up? Well, no, I, I, you know, I, I think on one side, there are certain things that have defined, are defined as crimes. They're, they're not legal, um, say extortion, for instance. Um, a question is, if you use AI to extort somebody, is that better or worse? Does it change the nature of the crime? Correct. Right. And yeah. who's actually doing the extortion? Right? Exactly, yeah, the, the reason for it. So it's, it's not necessarily that AI itself should be legal or illegal. It's still the basic act of what you're doing. You know, if, if using AI to commit an existing crime is wrong, then I think you should cod codify that in law. You should put that in there and say, yeah, if you use AI to do something, just like if you use a gun to commit a crime, there may be enhanced penalties for doing that. And then you get into something that's practical and en enforceable. Um, but it, in itself, AI as a technology, I, I think we should avoid saying it's legal or illegal, You know, it, it's good or bad, it's just a, a tool, it's a technology. Control seems pretty difficult. So the, the, thing yeah. to, the thing to fear and to kind of plan against is people's intentions when they use this tool, Correct. as with any technology. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. 
Um, Ryan, go ahead. Well, I mean, whether it's a DOE policy or a law, there is a proposed law in the legislature now um, to ban using AI to impersonate people for political purposes. Um, not that I'm an anarchist, but I, I'm terrified of the idea of government policy or DOE policy trying to put guardrails around something that is a tool, as has been said, like um, the, 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 the impersonation of someone is already a crime. It doesn't matter what they use. Um, and I think a paintbrush is not going to claim copyright and a paintbrush is not going to create art, right? It is the intent. It is the person behind it that is going to get credit or blame for something. Um, so I just sort of wanted to jump in specifically because there's a lot of conversation, even at the national level and the international level, about how do we regulate and control it. Um, I think um, it was someone who did point out, though, that when you're putting into these places these controls, you might say that the intent is to protect people, but there are always other motivations and unwanted results of it. And even when they were trying to say, let's stop development of all AI just for a little while while we figure it out, of course the companies that wanted that were the ones that were already Market six months ahead of everybody else. <laughs> and when you say AI is forbidden, but these models are open source and available to anybody, you're disadvantaging as many people as you're advantaging people. There are no pure intentions. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Kamala, this came in, and I, I'd love for you to take this on. Um, this comes in from a viewer on YouTube. What does Hawaii's diversity and culture generally mean for the speed and with, with which AI might learn, plus the challenges it'll face regarding inclusivity and usefulness to the average local resident? Yeah, that's a really good point. I think part of, because Hawaii is so diverse, I think you have a lot of worldviews. I think part of what I think about in terms of like the ethics of AI, part of what comes up for me is you know, ancestrally, not all knowledge was accessible by everybody. We had these terms that was codified in our society, a kapu and noa. Mm -hmm. These are things that are sacred to certain groups. These are things you have. If you're not a practitioner of, you have no right to. And that was enforceable because the government was, at the time, understood the value of, of, of that, right? And I think that from a Hawaiian perspective, how our knowledge is used, and it wasn't, not everyone, there are hardly any generalists, generalists in pre-contact society. Everyone was hyper-specialized, and your specialization defined what you knew and the knowledge base you had access to. So you couldn't just take that. Plus, every family's genealogy had their own knowledge that they weren't sharing. So what does it mean when we have that as a core culture, like indigenous knowledge, what are protections there um, to ensure that the knowledge is being used with the consent of the families? towards a goal that they would like to see not put out for general extraction. And then I think overlapping that though in Hawaii, we have so many diverse ethnicities that have naturalized to be in Hawaii and they all have different value sets. You know, I think from our Asian communities to Portuguese, there's different ways to relate to each other and different norms. And I think about like, what would AI look like that would honor the differentiation between them instead of trying to force us to be homogenous. I think those are all questions I think about. Like, I don't have an answer because we're not really dug into it yet. But I think from the intention, if you identify what you want your AI to optimize for and give it a clear parameter, the ethics and the outcomes, if we're having those conversations, then we can design towards those ends. And Hawaii has a really unique perspective because of our indigenous existence and presence of the indigenous community. But the layers of communities have come and called Hawaii home and normalized to being here. So I think it's a rich case study. That is such an interesting point, this idea that, you know, what, what David was talking about, that we want this to reflect the larger society, but at the same time, what it then does with that information right. becomes out of our control, right? right. Um, so there's a question here from Mara Miller, and I would love, Clara, for you to take this on. Um, you know, what about the human experience of doing things? I think we're all nostalgic for the past all the time. That sort of defines Hawaii, right? We're <laughs> we are a nostalgic community, but what she's writing here about, she says, you're talking a lot about the product and function of AI. What about the human experience of physically moving art across a canvas, writing your own words on paper, a plumber under the sink solving the problem? I mean, I think about this with my own kids and whether or not they're going to learn how to write in cursive, right? And <laughs> is that a useful tool? Is that a waste of time? Um, Clara, what, what are you take what do you say to Mara with these questions of the physical act of doing things and, and maybe that being efficient isn't always best 
So that's a great question. Um, I agree with a sentiment that I think most people have shared here on the panel today that um, it's not so much AI itself, it's the people that use it and how they use it. Um, I think that, of course, we all need to embrace um, not necessarily tradition, but I think that there is something to be said about the simpler things, just the quiet moments that we all need to have. I think it's important that we do balance that. Um, again, taking into account like the ideas of like tutoring and things like that, um, using AI. I know people who do use um, AI to help themselves understand their subjects better um, while still doing paper and pencil work um, in the end. So I think there's a balance. There's a balance of using this technology to your benefit while still um, keeping you know, to heart, um, not necessarily traditions, but keeping to heart um, your own self and your own touch to everything you do. Yeah, I mean, I know for myself, I only write when I'm writing the grocery list. Exactly. Like beyond that, I'm <laughs> typing everything. Riley, what do you think about that, that balance that Clara's talking about? Yeah, I think definitely um, we need that human balance, especially, um, I'm kind of a proponent that AI is a great tool. It should be used in a lot of applications, but there's also a lot of applications, a lot of areas in which AI shouldn't be used as well. So um, I think nowadays there's like a whole push from companies and even from in people with personal lives to be using AI. And I don't think that's necessarily the correct direction. I think people should be deciding whether AI adds value to their issues and problems and mm -hmm. whether it's, um, yeah, providing, providing that happiness, providing that um, satisfaction of physically painting, that's an example. Is AI going to add value to that? Probably not. Yeah. yeah. Leah, what do you think about that? This idea that, you know, if you want to generate a fashion line, maybe you need to learn on a sewing machine first, or is that not necessary? <laughs> I feel like now this defines every answer. <laughs> um, look, I think there are a few things. First of all, AI is coming, and I don't think no matter how much we discuss it, we're not going to affect whether it's coming or not. It will be here, right? So uh, we will have to deal with it one way or the other. Uh, second of all, I, I really believe that we shouldn't just have things outsourced to it and that's it, right? Um, we, you can see right now any text that's written with AI, you can understand that it's written with AI in a second. I see emails that, are, oh, nobody cared to proofread it in a way that <laughs> looks human, that <laughs> looks personal. <laughs> Somebody just you know, took five seconds to generate it. I'm not going to answer to that email, right? Because there's a lack of care. So whenever we do use AI, and I use it every single day, I treat it as my personal assistant, you know? Your personal assistant is not a clone of you. It's just somebody who helps your life be easier. And we can, not everybody can afford it, but now kind of everybody can in a way, right? But there should be a process where it should always start with a human idea and it should always end with a human curation. And everything in between is however you choose. And I, I really love your point. Like, does it add value? Because sometimes the answer is do not use AI at all. Right, and um, I think it will be a part of our lives, but we can choose how much yeah. and where. And, I and, think and Sean, that goes to what you were saying, the 10%, the 80%, the and then the yeah. final touch, right? The human idea, and then what she's talking about, the curation at the end. Yeah, and I think the to just go to everyone's point, um, I used to be in tech sales as well, and what I would tell people is, technology was developed and made to make our lives simpler in some area. If what I'm trying to sell you or this tool does not simplify your life or does not help you in any way, you don't have to choose to use it. Um, an example would be on why you may want to adapt it is my grandparents never wanted to get a smartphone because it was too complex for them. But when I get grandkids and they want to see kids, you know, FaceTime or some video call, that was the way of us being able to communicate easily without having them to drive down and see the kids all the time. So. In their way, it benefited them to get technology because now I can have this piece of technology to be able to communicate them wherever I am. So I think, again, it's the human perspective of does the tool help you in any way? Does it benefit you in any way? If you enjoy painting on a canvas and that's where you, what brings you joy, then you should paint on a canvas. You shouldn't use AI <laughs> to generate art. Um, so again, yeah, I think it's uh, the human aspect of everything. Like, Do you want to use it or do you not?
Samantha, I think you wanted to weigh in. Yeah, I just wanted to say, I think it raises the important distinction in how we view it and use AI and, and being intentional with it is there's a difference between purpose and process. What AI is really good at doing is helping us figure out and refine our processes, but it can't provide us a purpose. And it goes all the way back to our original question about you know what we think about our own existence. Um, we per, we we create our own purpose, right? The AI is not going to give us that. Mm -hmm. I wanted to. I think this is a really good. Uh, I was thinking a lot about you know one of the com like why it's so important to have indigenous perspectives, because I feel like in indigeneity optimizes for continuity of a genealogy, and care for your responsibility, and it doesn't have built-in human obsolescence in its course. Like the elders were revered because they held so much knowledge. Right, and that was, we didn't just revere them because they're old. Pre-contact society, being old was an accomplishment <laughs> because you had no other life, or yeah, the life and death buffer was so thin, right? So I just think like AI can never replace rigor. It can never replace like this, um, I think you can tell when something is done with rigor, even like there'll be, a, I really appreciate your comments, like there'll be a great shaking out because if you use it to cheat, you'll catch up with you. Right? And as long as we have a place where our practices are maintained, we can understand, are these useful to our practices? Those are ultimate testing grounds, right? And I do believe that that is something that I'm really curious about, like what role it could or could not play. But I do like, I really appreciate the idea that the, the, the focus on human continuity is a core tenet of indigenous thinking. Like your genealogy is everything. And what does that mean for AI? And what does that show up in supporting that thinking is a question mark we're holding. Mm -hmm. Deborah. <clears throat> the, we can't possibly begin to talk about this right now. But one of the biggest crises in this generation and in education is the social emotional learning. Yeah. And they are so inundated yeah. with technology. And I appreciated the comment about the plumber and the sewing or the, you know, when they haven't learned to use their hands, when they haven't learned to walk away from yeah. technology and get into that open space, into nature or into something hands on or or putting the brush across the canvas and finding out, wow, that really didn't work. Yeah. <laughs> you know, how do you do that? <laughs> um, until we can address that, and, and I think that's what's happening with this generation. We're adding another gigantic yep. piece of technology to their lives, and they've already, they've never known a world without technology like, like some of us in the older generations have. And so there, there definitely needs to be a balance and I think that um, our, our students right now are in crises mentally. We're, we have a whole mental um, aid crisis right now with our students. And, and that's something that needs focus as well, and that human aspect, yeah. and bringing in that indigenous knowledge of bringing them back to, to the aina and yeah. getting their hands dirty. Um, needs to play a role too. So when you say it's a tool and if it's not adding benefit, well, it can add benefit, but it can also do a lot of harm. Mm -hmm. And we really need to balance that. And we need to bring these kids um, back into a, a space. All of us, I all think. Of, <laughs> all of us can put our phone down. <laughs> yeah. uh, I wanna get to you in a moment, but I, I would love for, uh, for, for Scott to answer this one um, because we're talking a lot about some of the the duality here and a lot of the negatives but this this viewer says what possibilities could AI have with people living with disabilities and having accessibility I mean this is this is doing some amazing thing in that yes regard. that's a that's a terrific question and AI can have an impact on multiple kinds of disabilities so um, I think maybe first thing to think about with AI would be cognitive disabilities to help with uh, memory. You could imagine an AI companion that helps you remember things, day-to-day mm -hmm. um, -day things, or helps you remember things from the past that you may have forgotten uh, that would bring you joy to remember if only you could bring them up in your own head. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that is one major thing. Also, um, AI could assist in helping people with medication, um, keep track of their medications. Uh, of course, in the whole medical world, um, AI is changing everything, the diagnosis and 
uh, treatment and detection. We have an interesting project at UH right now on detecting behavioral and cognitive disorders from video of, um, you know, of children playing or interacting. Can you just train an AI system to watch, say, children playing and come up with, uh, you know, uh, tell a doctor you should check this child for certain um, problems? So, and then once it becomes more uh, in terms of robots and things like that, you can have them actually caring for people, doing surgery, robotic surgery, um, and caring for people that way. So there are a lot of upsides. Ryan, I would love for you to take this one on from Catherine. Uh, in, Kapi in the Kapi'olani Park area. One of the things people come to Hawaii for is relief from technology. AI is really taking away from what the islands are all about. I think any technology, I mean, that's like, maybe you shouldn't bring your smartphones when you come to Hawaii. <laughs> um, I, I certainly uh, appreciate the point. I, 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 I really think that the education conversation kind of flows in and the human experience and everything. We, I'm sorry, Scott, but we're not gonna be teaching every kid to program because now AI can do that. But I think every, I think the required class should be debate. I mean, it comes down to trust. It comes down to authenticity. When you come, when you come to Hawaii, you want to see a real thing, and I think finding that real thing and making that connection is going to drive us, just like finding love, um, whatever the tool is that might be distracting us at the time. Yeah. And so, where do you stand on this idea of embrace it or fear it? I think that it's, it's a tool, and I wouldn't ban a pencil, and I wouldn't ban a hammer even though it could be harm. And so I would say, I would, I would probably embrace it. <laughs> <laughs> Clara, I would love to hear from you. You know, we've, we've talked a lot about, uh, about a lot of different issues, but this is really affecting your generation perhaps more than anyone else. When you look at that question of embrace it or fear it, where do you land? Um, I would say that um, I would embrace it. I mean, I know some people would be more hesitant than others, but I would say uh, that I would. Um, it's obviously a tool to be used, and it's a tool that clearly it's expanded so much within just the last few years. There's nothing we can do to get rid of it or stop its use, especially in my younger generation that's so used to technology. So it's something that I feel like we have no choice but to embrace. And there are many ways, um, as you have heard throughout this whole panel, that we can embrace it in great ways. And there are many ways in which it could cause a lot of harm. I mean, for my generation now, we might not think of it like that. You might think, well, if you get caught using AI, it might just mean you get a zero on this paper. But in the future, um, it could affect someone much larger than you. So I think that we'll be seeing how it can affect my generation either positively, helping a whole entire society, or how it could lead to misinformation and so many other things. So time will tell, but it's something that I think we're forced to embrace. I think this generation has a lot of wisdom. That's a great place to leave us tonight. Thank you so much. Mahalo to all of our guests and to you at home for being a part of tonight's town hall. We will be back with another Kako in April talking about well-being. For many of us, life simply is overwhelming. Whether it's financial pressures, our political climate, fears about the future, there is a laundry list of stressor out there. So how can we all cope? We'll be focusing on de-stressing in a pretty stressful world. We hope you join us then. I'm Yanji Denise. Until next time, aloha.
This program was made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Local broadcasts of Kako are made possible by the support of viewers like you. Mahalo and bye. Young Brothers, providing quality service you can count on. Connecting our island communities for over 120 years as the state's leading inter-island freight transportation.